Like the pioneers of an earlier day, science makes many of its own tools as the need for them arises. And these little coil springs are examples of such tools. The unusual thing about these springs is that they're made of glass, a special glass, fused quartz, and are used to measure tiny differences in weight under chemical or heat conditions in which common spring materials such as steel or bronze would be useless. For instance, here is a case in which a quartz spring is being used to study the weight change of a sample of a new insulating material under the influence of a moist, corrosive atmosphere. The varying elongation or stretch of the spring with change in weight is measured with a special telescope device. Quartz glass is practically unaffected by most chemicals. Notice that a bath in nitric acid produces neither a visible reaction nor any signs of harm. Such immunity is not enjoyed by steel, as dipping the other spring shows. A strong reaction starts immediately, and the spring itself quickly becomes damaged. Such injury changes the stretch characteristics of the steel spring and makes it useless for delicate weight measurement. Heat will change the stretch of a steel spring because steel has a relatively high heat expansion, while quartz glass, whose heat expansion is just about nothing, maintains the same stretch under changing temperature. With a pencil point as a guide, let's see what has happened after three minutes. The steel has stretched, while the quartz has not, an important advantage in laboratory studies. Remember the lengths of these two springs before they are stretched. The quartz coil on the right may be stretched ten times or more its own length and still completely recover, while the same stretch in steel leaves a permanent elongation. The method used to make the hair-like fibers for the quartz springs is a highly refined version of a small boy pulling chewing gum. For to obtain the needed fiber, a small quartz rod is softened in the middle by an oxyhydrogen flame and then rapidly pulled apart. A 17-foot wire track is stretched tightly on a long bench. At one end is the quartz rod, at the other a small high-speed motor. The quartz rod is supported in a light two-part carriage, the left half of which is arranged to slide up the track like a shuttle and guide the left half of the rod as it is pulled away. Note also the string attached to the end of the rod. That is the pulling cord and runs the length of the track to a reel on the motor, which can be started and stopped very quickly by means of a push button. When the center section of the rod has reached the right temperature, nearly 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, watch the far end of the track now. The button is pushed, and zing! A single hair-like fiber is drawn. Only those strands are used which are within half a thousandth of being five thousandths of an inch in diameter for their entire length. A selected fiber laid out straight and supported for its full length in a small brass trough is led to the coiling machine where four tiny hydrogen flames soften the quartz just enough to allow it to bend and be wound into a spring around a coiling mandrel of the desired diameter. The feathers are not just symbols of the delicacy of the operation. They brush any specks of dust from the fiber before it reaches the flames. Such specks would cause the fiber to melt and break. And thus we have a gossamer spring of glass, a special tool of science, much like an ordinary spring scales. The principle is the same but the use and the degree of refinement are vastly different. Scientists are always on the watch for metals or alloys which have new magnetic properties. This apparatus, appearing somewhat like a bicycle wheel on stilts, was devised to demonstrate the peculiar magnetic properties of alnico and curie metal, two unusual alloys which are becoming very useful to electrical engineers. Since the effect of temperature is involved in the behavior of this combination of alnico and curie metal, suppose we light the wick of this alcohol burner to provide a convenient source of heat. Then we'll push the burner back into its place under the rim of the wheel and see what happens. Rotation, mechanical rotation from a direct application of heat. No steam, no boilers, no expanding gases, not even cylinders. And here's the answer. The outer rim of the wheel is a thin strip of one of our special alloys, the curie metal. When curie metal is cool, it is magnetic, but heated just a few degrees, and it loses its ability to be attracted by a magnet. This ability, however, is regained upon cooling, and the curie metal suffers no permanent loss. Iron behaves the same way, but it must be red hot before it becomes non-magnetic. The rim of the wheel runs freely between the poles of a horseshoe magnet 
made of alnico or other special alloy. Alnico can be magnetized very highly and permanently and is not affected by heat. Thus, although the flame strikes both rim and magnet, it changes only the rim, making it temporarily non-magnetic at the spot within the flame. But just above this spot, the rim is still relatively cool, is therefore magnetic, and so is pulled downward by the alnico. This action moves the wheel slightly, and since heating and cooling occur continuously, constant rotation takes place. Although this wheel is turned by unusual means, it is not an efficient source of motive power. It serves only to show the special properties of two materials which are being used more and more to improve electric control devices and make them more useful to home and industry. Safety on the night highways, a soft, steady band of golden light stretching away into the darkness. The high efficiency light of sodium lamps, one of the recent great contributions of science to modern lighting. And in the making of sodium lamps, science has solved a delicate and baffling problem, that of getting the sodium itself into each lamp free from impurities and untouched even by air. Sodium is one of the so-called alkali metals and is very tricky to handle. Since it reacts violently with water, even with the moisture in the air, it must be stored in kerosene to keep air and therefore water vapor away. In the new technique for putting sodium into the lamps, the metal is triple distilled to remove impurities using an air-free system made of glass in which a high vacuum is maintained. From a wire mesh container in distilling chamber number one, the sodium undergoes its first heating. Leaving some impurities behind as slag, it passes down into a second chamber where it forms a silvery mass. Then the first chamber is sealed off. The second heating, using an electric heater under an asbestos hood, vaporizes the sodium and drives it on to a third chamber. Heat is applied very slowly, since a slow surface evaporation, rather than boiling, is needed to prevent impurities from being distilled over with the sodium vapor. The vapor condenses on the inside surface of the chamber, but the sodium is not yet pure enough to produce a lamp that will not blacken. Now for the third step. In this stage of the distillation, the sodium is again vaporized and passed from chamber three down into chamber four, which looks like some sort of Christmas tree ornament. Ten minutes go by. The blackening of the glass by the hot sodium is well advanced, and the melted sodium itself is being forced down into the little glass balls or pellets by argon gas under pressure. Follow the arrow and watch the empty ball. There it goes. The argon gas is chemically inert and will not affect the sodium. Then each little pellet is sealed off, a tiny parcel of pure sodium, just the right amount for a sodium lamp, about one eightieth of an ounce. One pellet is placed in each lamp, the inside surface of which has a coating of special glass to resist the hot sodium vapor when the lamp is lighted. Then the stem carrying the electrical elements is fused into place, following which the lamp is connected to a vacuum pump, exhausted of air, filled with neon gas, and sealed off. Next comes the most interesting step of all, exploding the sodium pellet inside the lamp by means of a high-frequency electric coil. An ordinary lamp bulb with a few turns of wire around its base picks up enough energy to light and thus shows the heating effect of the high-frequency field. Now we'll substitute the sodium lamp and get set for our miniature explosion. Can you see the little sodium pellet inside the big lamp? The lamp is held so the pellet is always in the strongest part of the electric field. Now the metallic sodium is absorbing energy and growing hot. The glass softens and the pellet swells. Soon the sodium melts and then, flash, it has vaporized, shattering its tiny container and condensed into a silvery coating on the inside of the lamp. Development of the pellet technique Sodium had to be distilled into each lamp separate for and more expensive process. Once again, science has helped to make more available to more people at less cost.